New ideas are the cornerstone of creativity and are necessary to drive the hardware, software, and stories in video games to keep the medium at the forefront of technological media. However, games can have technical ideas that are so big, the scope of game development can't integrate them. Programming ideas that are so multitudinous, the engineers can't develop them all. Story ideas that are so world-altering, even thinking about them beyond plot points can undermine the very fabric upon which the game's universe is built. Unfortunately, the idea train has gone out of control. New ideas are being used for marketing, creating hype to increase pre-sales, even when an idea hasn't been proven to work. New story ideas are overriding established IP story canon and lore. Companies are no longer trying to make a quality game. They are building a new franchise they own, control, and can sell the rights to. This is what's happening with CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077. First, I want to say I like the world in the cyberpunk game. I love the genre, the technological order of science fiction, mixed with the punk attitude of anarchy and chaos, usually based in a world that considers humanity more of a resource than a reason. And Cyberpunk has one of my favorite non-gaming moments of all time, getting to ride a roller coaster with Keanu Reeves above the Night City shoreline. It made me smile and laugh. It was an in-game experience that would have been fun in real life. However, this game will need to make course corrections in line with game story theory for the Cyberpunk games to grow and expand. I know the game derived its history from the Pondsmith Cyberpunk role-playing game. I did hours of research on the history of the cyberpunk world, the timeline, and the corporations before making this video. It's a rich and dynamic history and one worthy of exploring. The problems we will be looking at are with the history and lore created within this game, and CD Projekt Red's future intentions with Cyberpunk 2077. In this video, we will jack into the cyberpunk game world, story, and concept to see how creative ideas and intellectual property intentions can hurt projects, hamper DLC expansion, and hamstring the future of a gaming franchise. The biggest problems when Cyberpunk was launched were technical, and therefore some people feel that falls onto the game programmers and developers. And why wouldn't they? It was a buggy mess of historical proportions. However, I don't feel that way. See, there are two reasons why a project fails. One way is a project can have carefully laid out plans using specific and obtainable project benchmarks, but the engineers and managers implementing the project blueprint fail, resulting in the failure of an achievable project outcome. Another way to failure is when those creating the project benchmarks promise an arbitrary launch that satisfies investors and ignores the project's status. When requisite time, and testing necessary to achieve the project creator's visions isn't granted, and those guiding and overseeing the entire production staff don't closely collaborate or listen to the feedback from the staff. This also leads to failure. CD Projekt Red was aware of the state of their project prior to release. They are professionals. They're not stupid. They knew it didn't match their own hype or meet consumer expectations. Now, there were small signs with Cyberbunk's debacle launch that pointed to the creative people overloading the engineers with ideas. An example was the NPC artificial intelligence promised that was to include unique daily routines and reactions. This was the first red flag because AI isn't just about programming or upgrading to meet the latest hardware like better graphics. The effectiveness of AI is registered by the user through perception. The result had to be perceivable by the players. Implementing this type of AI would drain gamer system memory when trying to operate in a city of dozens of NPCs. Now, noticeable memory consumption happens because NPC actions would have to be computed in real time and not drawn from set data strings. This type of AI implementation would have forced gamers to upgrade to the most advanced systems just to make their games run properly which went against another CD Projekt Red's promises that gamers wouldn't have to upgrade their systems for this game. This kind of AI would also require extensive testing by professional testers or with a beta release where player interactions and feedback could be used to train AI to be effective. 
Now, very few companies pay for extensive in-house testing since it has become a norm to release software, get the customer's money, then fix bugs and issues. Now, I know this to be true because I was told when programming for software companies not to fix problems customers haven't complained about because this could delay project completion dates and fixing bugs justifies post-launch employment. Companies also avoid beta testing because a game hidden from the public garnered with a lot of hype can recoup costs in pre-orders in day one sales, even if the game isn't good. However, even if Cyberpunk achieved their AI NPC goal, it would have failed to improve the game. The closest comparison to Cyberpunk's NPC unique reaction idea was Starfield's procedurally generated planets. Whatever time and money Bethesda spent on planet generation in Starfield, it didn't have any effect on the core complaints people had with the game or gameplay. Even if Bethesda made an amazing array of thousands of visually unique generated planets, the idea didn't include a thousand unique ecosystems, points of interest unique to each planet, and didn't connect to Starfield's multiverse concept or game story. Cyberpunk's NPC AI idea had the same problem. Despite being a pseudo-open world, Cyberpunk is a story-driven game. The game starts with story, and the gameplay ends with the story. Even if CD Projekt Red was successful in their AI promise, it wouldn't have made much difference in a game that is bound and driven by a story that has set characters who have to be at specific locations and perform specific actions to progress the story in which they are a part of. The rest of the NPCs in the world aren't interactable with other than combat reactions or a few that offer simple services at specific locations. So even if CD Projekt Red achieved this AI, it wouldn't have made much impact on the core game, experiencing the Johnny Silverhand or Phantom Liberty story. Cyberpunk and Starfield are both examples of big technological ideas that sound exciting and work great with marketing and hype, but burden the engineers with ideas that weren't going to add enough to the game to make it worth the manpower and time, and pull efforts away from maximizing simple core gaming elements. And this leads us to a situation I refer to as Chekhov's BFG. Anton Chekhov was a Russian playwright who was excellent at developing dramatic situations within a scene and between scenes. The term Chekhov's gun refers to the concept that if a gun is going to be used in pivotal dramatic moments, that gun needs to be introduced earlier in the play to establish its existence. Chekhov's BFG is my mirror concept to Chekhov's gun, which states that if a gun is shown to a player in a game, they should be able to use that gun in a pivotal moment. Chekhov's BFG refers to the game Doom, where a player discovers research on a weapon called the BFG, or Big Frickin' Gun, then later gets to find the BFG and gets to use it in the final stages of the game. When a player finds out about a special weapon, they want it. They want to use it. And it should be as satisfying as the player imagines. Chekhov's gun and Chekhov's BFG are both about setup and payoff. Now, Chekhov's gun fails when the setup is done improperly, usually by making the gun setup so obvious the audience is expecting the gun when it's finally used, reducing the impact of that pivotal moment. Chekhov's BFG fails when a weapon that is set up as special doesn't feel special when wielded by the player, or the player gets to see the weapon used but doesn't actually get to use it. It's ultimately a player tease or a gameplay disappointment. Cyberpunk has Chekhov's BFG, but it fails with the implementation. The weapon is the Flathead Spybot drone. The Flathead is used as part of the most complete mission sequence in the game the infiltration of Yurinobu Arasaka's apartment to steal tech. The player is told by his fixer, Dexter Deshawn, that to safely get inside the, and pass security, the player will need to acquire a piece of elite Militech hardware known as the Flathead. Acquiring the Flathead leads to the gang who stole it trying to rip you off and kill you, Militech hiring you to find out who stole it, and finally the player getting away with the Flathead spybot and their life. It's a significant sequence of events that proves how valuable this Flathead Spybot is. While being briefed on the Flathead, the player is told by Dexter Deshawn that it will be a single-use item. That statement threw up a red flag in my mind because if game developers create a fun gaming mechanic for use of the Flathead, they would use it more than once in a game. For example, 
Later in the game, the player hijacks a gunship basilisk from a Militech caravan. The player later gets to use the gunship with the Aldecado clan to fend off a Militech counterattack, and also in an assault on Arasaka's Mikoshi project. In another game mechanic, a player gets to hack into a flying drone and view from the drone's POV, which is done when kidnapping Hellman, rescuing Saul, and the assault on Mikoshi. Both the gunship and the flying drone hack were unique and fun game experiences, and the designers let players use it more than once. I want to say I have praise for the Arasaka heist sequence, which the Flathead is a part of. Searching the apartment, watching the murder of Saburo Arasaka, having to escape with Jackie, my partner in crime, jumping off the side of a skyscraper building, fighting through a gauntlet of security guards, barely escaping Atom Smashers he tries to stop you, only to watch Jackie bleed out in the car from his wounds is one of the great sequences in video gaming where a player gets to share an unforgettable experience with an NPC before their death. It's a sequence of events that shows when game story and gaming design work synonymously, it can create unforgettable moments players love to play again and again. It's also a sequence that shows how creative story ideas can overwhelm the design and lead to underwhelming results. The fetch quest you go on to get the Flathead bot is significant and is played out in an extended mission. However, when the player finally gets to de deploy the Flathead bot, it equates to one of the most boring and underdeveloped gameplay moments in the game, one which I would equate to a cheap mobile game. You're given the chip to interact with the Flathead, but you don't control it at all. As the spy bot works its way into security, you watch it from a third person view by hacking into stationary cameras. And for some reason, this hotel has cameras everywhere the flathead goes, including inside small vents. I would think the whole point of having a flathead spy bot is it can crawl up walls and go in places where cameras don't exist. Anyway, the flathead bot wanders through the vents and rooms, of which the player has no control over. Use the player look around at objects highlighted in yellow, while T-Bug, the netrunner who's guiding you, tells you, yes, that's the object you want, or no, that's not the right object. Once you select the right highlighted item, the flathead bot moves itself. Let me repeat, you highlight the right object, and the flathead bot moves to it. There's no time limit, no trial and error or failure, because T-Bug tells you if your choice is right or wrong, and therefore no excitement or suspense is felt using the flathead. The whole flathead sequence felt like the designers were overwhelmed. It was set up to be a big deal by all the fetch quests to get the flathead, but then deploying it equates to watching it. Using the spy bot here could have been cut and would have not hurt this mission sequence. The flathead was set up as Chekhov's BFG. It should have been presented as a first-person experience where the player saw from the POV of the flathead crawling through vents and up walls, under beds, and trying to locate items in the room, as well as not being seen by workers and guests. That would have been gameplay that justifies all the missions to acquire the flathead and given a payoff worthy of Chekhov's BFG setup. It should have been a moment capable of failure, or if the flathead was spotted, it set off alarms. Or if the flathead took the wrong route, the flathead would be discovered and traced back to V in the room. This would have added excitement to the moment, as well as forced the player to use their own deductive reasoning to get through, instead of mindlessly clicking until T-Bug lets us progress. And if they created the flathead POV first-person gameplay I suggest, the flathead could have been used again in a later mission. First, Dexter could have had us get a pair of flathead bots, one for the Arasaka mission, and the second one for Dexter's personal arsenal. After the tower heist, we're shot in the head by Dexter for the havoc we caused in the botched heist. Dexter is then killed by Takamura, Saburo Arasaka's head of security, who wants justice for the murder of his boss and rescues us from the landfill. Takamura eventually shows us a secure warehouse where parade floats are being kept part of Takamura's plan to confront Saburo's daughter, Hanako, during the parade. In this warehouse are floats we need to hack into in order to reach Hanako Arasaka to tell her the truth about her father's murder. During this mission sequence, we sit across the street from this warehouse and do that same click on yellow highlighted objects while Takamura tells us if it will help us get into the warehouse or not, very much like T-Bug does in the Flathead sequence. 
Instead of this boring gameplay moment, I would have V suggested to Takamura we break into Dexter's private arsenal and steal the second flathead bot. Then deploy the flathead and use it to find a way into the warehouse and locate where the parade float controls are. Now once V uses the flathead to figure out a way in and where to go, the player can use that information when V breaks into the warehouse to hack the float. Using it at the warehouse sequence would have allowed the flathead to stand out as a moment instead of being smashed in with a dozen other moments at Arasaka. It would have made the float sequence more exciting and a better resolution for the setup of Chekhov's BFG, one that would have been unexpected. We thought we stole the flathead for Dexter's private arsenal, forgot about it when shot by Dexter, but later remember it and steal the flathead back to use it at the warehouse. It would have also allowed the player to reuse a fun game mechanic. Now the current gameplay of the flathead raises questions as to whether making a moment of interaction equates to good gameplay. I liked being able to scan in the open world when trying to decide what to hack, and it made sense using it when looking through brain dances with Judy Evelyn's Techie. Brain dances were those recorded three-dimensional images that you could stop, focus on something, then zoom in and investigate it to determine what it is while having a discussion with Judy. You could also see thermal and audio representations, giving a brain dance depth that makes scanning with it special. And when you use brain dances with Judy to see inside your Nova's apartment, or to locate where Evelyn might be kidnapped, it shows brain dances are more than a form of erotic entertainment. But instead of using brain dances at other moments, the game kept repeating the mechanic of V scanning items on locations while the NPCs would tell us if that's what we wanted or not. These sequences never made sense to me or felt natural. It was used with the flathead bot, which equated to boring gameplay. It was used at the warehouse with Takamura, but it was unnecessary because I could see where the gun turrets were without scanning, see where the guards were, and the entry points, but I couldn't see inside the warehouse. This mechanic is used when we're at the ambush location Pan Am chooses to steal her truck back. This didn't make sense because if Pan Am decided to steal her truck back at this ambush point, she already scanned it and knew where everything was, and already had a plan before asking me to help. It was used with Reed in Phantom Liberty, where you scan ahead for Reed, even though he's a highly trained and experienced spy who wouldn't trust some street merc to guide him. All these moments use this mechanic of scanning highlighted things while NPCs said yes or no, forcibly making moments interactive, but equated to boring and unnecessary gameplay. However, these moments would have been interesting if they were done as brain dances. They all occurred before action sequences as preparation for what was to come. These situations were also part of NPCs' plans, so having brain dances of these locations to prepare would make total sense. It would have also added an extra dimension with the audio and thermal layers. And because these are brain dances, we understand why there's no time limit and no consequence for error. The game already had the brain dance mechanic. It would have made total sense the NUSA realized how effective brain dances were for surveillance and had spies like Reed using it as part of mission planning. The Aldacados had a number of clan members who were ex-military, so they understand how brain dances could be used as mission ops. And the head of Arasaka security, Takamura, would definitely have used brain dances to scan locations for security breaches and weaknesses. Most importantly, brain dance mechanic gave the player a sense of control, switching between visual, thermal, and audio, versus the on-location scanning, which felt more like a Where's Waldo mechanic. Now, I've given numerous examples where big ideas were not properly incorporated or explored, where creative supervisors should have shelved these ideas knowing they were not going to be fully realized as imagined, or taken more time to fully develop and seamlessly integrate them into the story world they created. Game stories end, but many games do not end with the story which allows players to continue to play the game by adding DLCs, which includes raids and PvP battles. Or, if the game is a true malleable open world, a player can continue to build bases and change landscape to create the game world into their vision of a world they desire. By actually having a game end the moment the story ends, this raises issues on how to maintain player retention. 
It becomes even more difficult when a game kills the player at the end of the game because it removes the possibility of DLCs extending the game beyond the conclusion that anything the player built meant anything because the death prevents its use or usefulness and the player avatar won't exist or be playable in future games. So there's no reason a player becomes attached to the character which they played as or even remember them. Cyberpunk 2077 tries to be a role-playing game but dialogue options are generally exposition and rarely affect the story or mission. You can choose an ending path, but you can't control the direction of that path. Each path is basically an agreement to help the main character of that quest until the player reaches their inevitable end. The game even tells you this by giving the player a message when making these choices that if the player continues, they will not be able to play any other mission. Cyberpunk is not a rail story game because the story is not common among all players. Each path creates a completely different history in this game and a different future. It's these differences that prevent Cyberpunk from having a unifying ending, even though the endings of the player's Avatar V is the same regardless of which path you choose. But before we look at how Cyberpunk handles the player's end, Let's look at a character's end in Cyberpunk storyline that the game does an excellent job of presenting, the death of Jackie Wells. Jackie is an NPC companion and a literal partner in crime to V. Jackie's death is tied to a unique and memorable mission made of many layers, which we already discussed as the Arasaka Tower Heist. We get to hang out and swag with Jackie at Mission Start, break into an Arasaka Tower apartment to steal top-secret data chips, witness a murder, make escape, which includes jumping off the edge of a skyscraper, battling with Jackie through a gauntlet of enemies, flee from a terrifying boss, only to see Jackie bleed out as we safely get away. It's a sequence of excitement and sadness. We lost a friend, but we shared what was the most memorable mission of the game. It allowed us a heroic moment with Jackie so we could respect him as an NPC and miss him when he was gone. But most importantly to this conversation, every player experienced the exact same moment and sequence of events, regardless of which character path they chose to start the game or choices made up to this point. Jackie's death and how he died are now story canon and can be referred to in future games and DLCs as world history. Doing this allows the game to build upon the memory of Jackie and unifies player experience into a definable gameplay moment. Even the most open RPGs understand the need for unifying common moments to crucial story events. Baldur's Gate 3, one of the best RPG games in recent times, regardless of any player choices, had every player start on a mind flare ship. In the middle of the game, players discover humans and gods working with an enslaved Elder Brain, and players finish the game battling the Elder Brain. So no matter how a player chooses to play the game, these moments can be referred to in the DLCs and future games, if only to add depth and context to the game world. This creates a common game history among players, regardless of their individual gaming experiences. Cyberpunk starts this way with every player getting involved with Jackie in his death and getting Johnny Silverhand trapped in their heads, a common unifying experience, but then fails to unify this experience for all players with how the game progresses towards an end, despite the fact that they set this game up to have a common ending for all players, that every player's avatar, V, becomes disconnected from their physical body, either by death, becoming digital, or the Phantom Liberty ending of being disabled. However, Making every player's version of V's life over in this world cannot be called a unifying experience, because the game lets players choose how their life ends in various locations under unrelated circumstances. Now let's take a look at these disconnected storylines. You can choose to get involved in the Arasaka family murder drama, relying on Arasaka technology to cure you of Johnny Silverhand. You can choose to go with Pan Am and lead Nassaltum and Koshi to access the servers for the AI Alt Cunningham to cure you of Johnny Silverhand. Or you can choose the Phantom Liberty ending where the new USA scientists will work to cure you of Johnny Silverhand. Regardless of which path you choose, the end result in Cyberpunk will give the player two choices. Either be downloaded in the data and become a digital being or return to your body free of Johnny Silverhand 
but with a life expectancy of a couple months, with one Phantom Liberty ending, which V is in a coma and awakes disabled. In all cases, the game essentially ends with the player walking through a closing sequence of non-events. Despite all the player pass, V will physically cease to exist as a playable character. Now, there are two choices in the main game story, a slow death of dying in your physical body or a quick death of getting your personality, not your soul, uploaded. Those who argue becoming digital is not death, the game calls the device that removes your personality from a human and stores them digitally the soul killer, because when your personality is uploaded digitally, your soul is killed off. The game uses that term, kill your soul, because they want you to know, in essence, you are dead. Without a body and without a soul, the digital engram is merely habits and traits of V. I mentioned if you choose the Phantom Liberty ending, you fall into a two-year coma, then awake with a brain disability, unable to connect to cyber implants and thus unable to use them. This ending is the same as death because not only does your character lose all abilities, but the game story goes to great lengths to make sure the world you awaken has changed so much the player is no longer part of it. V comes out of the coma and discovers everyone is gone, including love interest, and Night City has changed. But the game gives no plausible explanation or reason. V does locate his Ripper Dr. Victor after awakening. Before the coma, Vic survived to middle age as a back alley doctor. But after a two-year coma, Victor has suddenly become the equivalent of an HMO doctor. Did the underworld and the need for back alley implants completely disappear from Night City in two years? We also run into Jackie's girlfriend, Misty, who before read tarot cards and owned Mystic Shop, but now she's mentally grounded and moving out of the city. For 50 years, Johnny's friends and hangouts in the city could be located in the same places, but after this two-year coma, Everything V knew is gone. It's as if the writers wanted to make the player feel like so much changed after being in a coma for two years, ignoring that they created a timeline that remained the same for 50 years. This coma is the most world-breaking in the game because nothing before the coma set up this rapid world evolution post-coma. Johnny Silverhand's fate is more convoluted than V's. If you choose the Alt Cunningham ending, Johnny either ends up back as a digital entity with alt, or takes over V's body and becomes back to life but has no soul. In this game world, they scientifically identified and established a soul exists. So what does it mean to have a soulless Johnny Silverhand alive? Why do they never address the significance of a soul, or how a soulless being is different yet mention a soul can actually be killed off? Another big idea pushed into the game that is world-altering, yet the story ignores. Now, continuing with Johnny, in the Phantom Liberty ending, the New USA, or NUSA, destroys the Johnny Silverhand engram. In the Arasaka ending, you're on a space station. There's also no mention of Johnny's engram by Arasaka. And why would Arasaka save Johnny's engram when the game story proves Johnny can escape Arasaka and take form, and Johnny still hates Arasaka, so... There's no reason for Arasaka to preserve Johnny Silverhand's engram or save copies. Sabora Arasaka has had his engram placed into his son's body at the end of the Hanako Arasaka storyline, which was the real goal of Soul Killer Tech, make the elite and wealthy immortal. We just broke down that Cyberpunk 2077 gives us two endings that cause Johnny's complete deletion, one ending with Johnny living digitally, in one ending with Johnny coming back to life in V's human body. In none of these storylines is Johnny presented as a hero. In the past, Johnny set off an atomic bomb at Arasaka Towers that most definitely killed at least his innocent fans who he gathered at the Arasaka Tower entrance to be a distraction while he infiltrated from the roof. So Johnny sees life as disposable. He failed to save Alt Cunningham, who he treats like shit in the flashbacks, and when he tries to free her, he pulls the cable that causes her body to die and traps her on a net. Johnny is never the cause of V's success in his missions, but he is the cause of V's current problems. Even when Johnny takes over V's body temporarily during gameplay, he gets drunk and has sex instead of trying to reclaim something meaningful from his previous life, or show the gamer something about Johnny the world didn't know. In the ending where he takes over V's body, 
All he does is act tough and play guitar without purpose, riding off into the sunset with no direction. And it's a real shame, too. Keanu Reeves' personality gives the character a presence you want to like. Johnny is always pontificating and adding opinions to our character's situation, but he never has any real insights into the world that a player can apply to the game as knowledge or wisdom. And since Johnny failed at the things he attempted to do to make change, his words come across more as a preachy loser judging us than a streetwise rebel trying to guide us toward success. As a result, Johnny Silverhand's character is nothing more than a story plot device in 2077, and the game makes sure to never show Johnny as a hero. He isn't close to those around him in flashbacks, nor does anyone seem to truly care about Johnny. Not one person who knew Johnny talks about his death as like a great loss or wishes he was still alive. He has no family or relatives. This was all done intentionally by the game creators and is a major clue that Johnny Silverhand will not be more than a piece of history in future games and not an integral character. That's three possible Johnny Silverhand endings, three possible V endings, with four different story paths leading to these endings, two of those paths from Phantom Liberty. That combines to seven possible story histories, yet all this variation has a common outcome. The player's avatar V dies physically, or with Phantom Liberty, comatose then disabled. And that is where the creative ideas put into the game collide with the story gameplay. The game wants players to feel as if their choices affect the game outcome, but with all these paths leading to the end of V, the game is telling every player their choices don't matter. They will have no effect on the outcome. If a player lets Johnny have their body, they want to feel like they brought someone great back to life, but nothing in the game story nor in the gameplay of becoming Johnny Silverhand shows the sacrifice will have any real meaning. The commonality of having an ending where all paths lead to the end of the player, yet the game story outcome in each path is so different, means there's no set history to the demise of V, even though V no longer being a cyber mercenary is now canon. And how do you refer to V's death, digitization, or disablement if mentioning it brings into question which events actually occurred? Now set aside V and Johnny and take a look at the possible futures created from these three different story paths. Helping Hanako Arasaka avenge her father, Saburo, reveals Saburo had an engram made of himself. This leads to the engram of Saburo taking control of his son Yorinobu's body resulting in Saburo coming back to life. In this ending, Saburo will likely go on to be over 200 years old. The other storylines end with his son Yorinobu still in control of the Arasaka Corporation and Saburo gone. The Mikoshi Alt Cunningham AI storyline gets Alt past Netwatch, Blackwall that has isolated her for 50 years, which allows Alt access to the most powerful technical equipment at Mikoshi. The Mikoshi Tech gives Alt the hardware that keeps Johnny Silverhand in existence, either physically or digitally. In all other endings, Alt Cunningham is still imprisoned by Netwatch. Also in this storyline, the Alt Akados Noband clan leads the assault on Arasaka's Mikoshi complex, killing men and downing ships. Arasaka would definitely declare war on the Alt Akados whether they leave the city or not. In the other storylines, the Aldecados never mess with the Arasaka Corp. The Phantom Liberty story is completely disconnected from the main storyline because you can only get that history if you pay for the DLC and because the main story game ends. So the DLC has to be attached to the game as an extended side quest, not a continuation of the game. In the Phantom Liberty storyline, the president of the new USA is shot down in her plane while flying over a section of Night City. Phantom Liberty also has Militech rogue Kurt Hansen take complete military control of a city district, Dogtown, and is the one responsible for shooting down the president. Eventually, Kurt Hansen is killed, either by Alex, an NUSA spy, or the player in a boss fight. If the president of the NUSA gets shot down in this world, the death of Kurt Hansen wouldn't satisfy the NUSA government since he didn't fire the rockets at her ship, nor was he in the field trying to prevent her escape. Dogtown Militech is an actual regime with many layers of command and people carrying out orders. 
every existing government in reality would go to war with an organization that shot down their president and not just be satisfied with the death of the organization's leader. The NUSA military would dismantle Dogtown rule and arrest anyone involved with shooting down and attempting the kidnapping of the president. But this doesn't happen in this game. And when you return to the main game after playing Phantom Liberty, there's no mention of the events that occurred. It's as if they never happened. This is the DLC problem of having a game ending and a player avatar die. Instead of Phantom Liberty taking place after the main story, adding to the story history, this and any DLC has to take place parallel to the main story, meaning it can't integrate main story elements or be a part of that world. Phantom Liberty and any other DLC added will have to be unrelated standalone content that has V-Die or become useless, or allows the player to return to the main game where the world of the DLC never existed and won't be mentioned. This is a problem, because even in this cyber world, an attack on an elected president would be bigger news than the death of a 150-year-old corporation head who most of the world expected to die one way or another at his age. Even with Saburo's death, the company is still under Arasaka family control, now run by his son Yorinobu. So, as they say in England, the king is dead, long live the king. Also, if you choose the Phantom Liberty ending, Adam Smasher is still alive after the game, and he's been at the core of Arasaka personal security for over 60 years. That's a big change considering Adam Smasher dies in both endings of the main game. From all these possible storylines, it's impossible to create a unifying experience that will become game canon, even though having every player end in physical death implies that the original game story was intended to have a unifying player end that could be canon. And they left themselves with one big problem for the next game installment. Where do you go from here? In this game, the leader of the largest corporation dies and comes back to life in his son's body. The president of the NUSA is shot down and rescued by a player, a common street mercenary. The most powerful AI in the world is freed from a 50-year prison behind the black wall. How does Cyberpunk top that in the next game installment? These are the three most important characters in this world, and they are not only part of the storylines, they are the main characters whose very existence are in the balance of the player's hands. How do you top or match that in the next game? A great example of starting a franchise with events too big is the classic film Raiders of the Lost Ark. In the first Indiana Jones movie, Indy obtains the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the Word of God and God's power as well. How do you top an artifact from God? The second installment, Indy got a stone artifact from the god Shiva, which didn't quite have the same impact when you established a monotheistic god in your first story, but it tries to match it by being another god artifact. In the third movie, Indy went after the Holy Grail, an artifact of Jesus who is God's son, but not as powerful as God. You had crystal skulls from aliens in the fourth movie, and then in the final installment, a time-traveling relic. You can see the problem here. They had a charismatic, adventuring treasure hunter who was primed to do many movies. But the artifact in the first adventure was so significant and of the single most important being in existence, every following movie had to create a god-tier artifact for him to go after. And yet none could achieve the importance of the artifact from God. They had a character primed for a franchise, but a story that gave them nowhere to go. Cyberpunk is in the same position. They created a world primed to give rise to a video game franchise, but a storyline that is too fractured to build from, and events of such significance, there is a little a player could do that is greater than saving the president, bringing the most powerful corporation leader back to life, and freeing an AI that was imprisoned for half a century. All this storyline discussion doesn't even address the extreme power showed by Netrunners in 2077. Songbird in Phantom Liberty has a power called Black Wall Blast that could destroy armored vehicles and immobilize an entire armed battalion. If you chose to capture Songbird, she used this power when she became cyberpsychotic to escape from V and Kurt Hansen and get into the Militech secret lab. And if you choose to help her, 
She extends this power to V, and the player gets to use the power while carrying Songbird to the moon rocket. When you use the power, a click of the mouse disables everything, including an attack helicopter, allowing a safe, unarmed, slow walk escape while being attacked. This power changes Netrunners from hackers to potential superheroes. They no longer can just control technology. They have lethal power within themselves. In the main story, Alt Cunningham showed Netrunners can become immortal, able to leave their bodies and exist on the net. This is a Netrunner's ability to escape death. Cyberpunk 2077 has evolved Netrunners into beings like the Sirens in the Borderlands franchise. And by Borderlands 3, Sirens were so powerful, the main villain was a Siren who had all the interstellar corporations afraid of her. And the hero Siren Lilith was powerful enough to move a moon away from a planet's orbit. That's a long cry from Borderlands past of corporations, mercenaries, and bandits battling on planet surfaces which is very similar to the history of corporations, gangs, and mercenaries battling in cyberpunk. So while cyberpunk 2077 was killing off V, Jackie, Johnny, and the cyber mercenary class of character, the game was building up the Netrunner's physical power, ability to become AI, and be immortal. What is consistent and set in cyberpunk 2077 are the parts of the game CD Projekt Red does plan to continue. Alt Cunningham is AI at the start of the game, and at the end of the game, is still AI no matter what path you choose. Whether you choose the Arasaka ending or the Makoshi ending, the engram of a person can take over a living body and return to life, be it Johnny Silverhand or Saboru Arasaka. And if you play Phantom Liberty, whether you choose to end the game in the DLC or return to the main story, Songbird shows her superhero level black wall blast. These facts exist no matter which path you choose. These outcomes are the ones that CD Projekt Red wanted to establish in this game and future stories. Super powerful netrunners and dead characters can be brought back to life by downloading engrams into body. These ideas set up what CD Projekt Red wants to do in the franchise's future. What is also true is that Johnny Silverhand, a character carried over from Cyberpunk 2020 timeline, is never shown as a true hero in 2077. Johnny never saves anyone, never beats the antagonist. Johnny is part of the old 2020 cyberpunk universe, which will likely be downplayed and written out of CD Projekt Red's new cyberpunk creations. Now, if you're uncertain how important the Netrunner class is to CD Projekt Red, realize that we played as a cyber mercenary class character, but our character was dependent on this class of Netrunner, T-Bug guided us in early missions. Mama Bridget took us to the Black Wall and Alt Cunningham. Alt Cunningham separated us from Johnny, and Johnny needs Alt to stay in existence. And Songbird in Phantom Liberty was both an overpowered victim and villain. They were all Netrunners. They were the answer to our problems, necessary to complete and progress in missions, and either feared or embraced by factions in this world. I ask this question. Was this fractured story history done intentionally by CD Projekt Red, not establishing a canon storyline, not allowing the player's protagonist to live and become a hero in this world? And the answer is yes. CD Projekt Red will use the Pondsmith lore when they need to, but they will not be building on that lore. Phantom Liberty story was really about Songbird. The Mikoshi story was really about Alt Cunningham. And the Arasaka story was really about an engram being able to be placed back into a physical body to plant the seed that Alt or any other core dead character could take again physical form. Even Songbird in the ending where she dies could be revealed she's not actually dead but in a digital world. And she too once again can be human. The world they set up here, they don't have to write it into story. They could say in future games, Songbird escaped to the internet, or Mama Bridges escaped to the net, and bring either back as AI or in human form, and never have to explain it. By building ideas, and not history or lore, CD Projekt Red is free to create new characters or recycle old ones without having to establish it in history or canon, or connect it back to the Cyberpunk 2020 lore. This isn't the best storytelling technique, but it is a technique to create original ideas and content 
on an existing lore while breaking from that lore. They even built into the game an excuse on how to not bring character engrams back to life they don't want. After all, a big problem with having personalities able to be uploaded and downloaded into another body is anyone can do it. So they present both options, one with V struggling against Johnny's engram and the other with Saburo's engram downloaded into his son's body. Saburo's engram is stated as necessary to be put back into a body with compatible DNA, meaning a clone of the deceased or a blood relative, which is why his son's body was used. But the Johnny Silverhand engram, programmed by Arasaka, had the ability to rewrite DNA, meaning any human body could be made genetically compatible. CD Projekt Red did this, so in the future they could bring back any character they wanted and put it into any body, saying the code is rewriting the DNA, while explaining that characters they don't want to bring back can't return because there's no body available with compatible DNA. None of this is part of the original cyberpunk lore, however, CD Projekt Red is trying to build their new IP off of characters and character classes, and not a world of generational history. They can have a favorite character appear at any time, die, and come back to life, and they can create games and media around these characters and classes, and not worry about how the stories link or histories relate. This does what entertainment companies love in the multiverse concept, killing off characters for dramatic effect, then bringing those dead characters back to life. But it also causes the same multiverse problems, death becoming meaningless. For example, Saburo was killed. Takamura, his personal security, wanted to avenge his death, dying to do so, and his daughter, Hanako, wanted justice for her father. But when Saburo was brought back to life, the act of avenging him or seeking justice was meaningless, as was Takamura's death. Companies like using multiverse cheating death ideas. They don't care about the ramifications of death becoming meaningless. They just want the freedom to create new content from characters while ignoring canon and history. This game's story problems occurred because the game refused to commit to a set game history and resisted completely turning the game into a player-driven unique story. Instead, Cyberpunk tried to incorporate both. Not committing fully to either storytelling technique caused all endings to be both anticlimactic and insignificant to the game's future. Now, despite me outlining all the ways of not having a unifying common ending create problems with DLCs and future franchise installments earlier in this video, I believe all these unique storyline paths could have been the most exciting and talked about part of the game and led to some truly original DLC content if they didn't tie every ending to the unceremonious and heroic ending of the player's avatar V. Let me underscore unheroic. The way V reaches his death or digitization is akin to being in a hospital bed and told you have a fatal illness and the doctor gives you a choice of either dying slowly of your condition or committing assisted deletion. The moment is depressing, unexciting, and tells the player it's up to them which boring, unclimactic ending they want. CD Projekt Red should have went all in and created a unique outcome for the player's avatar with each different ending choice, since there's no set history in how they ended this game. The player's death shouldn't have been a direct question presented to the player as an option, which way do you want to die, but as a result derived from the player's decisions made along the final events leading to that moment. Let's take game story theory and apply it to how unique storylines could create unique endings by applying it to the existing cyberpunk endings. For example, helping the Hanaka Arasaka avenging her father Sabora storyline. If a player is loyal and helpful to Hanako, in the end, the player could be cured and offered to be Sabora's new personal bodyguard replacing Takamura, and tasked with eliminating any remaining Yurinobu supporters. Or, if the player expresses dissent along that mission, the player must escape, but is assassinated by Arasaka operatives to silence V. Look at the Mikoshi Alt Cunningham ending. If a player chooses to become digital with Alt and let Johnny Silverhand take the body, have the player be Johnny and blow up the Mikoshi complex to stop the soul storage process, repeating Johnny's signature act at Arasaka Towers 50 years ago, and then leaving graffiti that Johnny was here. 
Or, if the player chooses to return to V's body at Mikoshi, the player rejoins the Aldacado clan where they ask him to lead the group with Pan Am and fight their way back out of Mikoshi to freedom. If you play the Phantom Liberty ending and choose to end the game there, being loyal to President Myers and Reed will get them to ask you to become an agent, but you have to cover up events hiding Songbird's existence if you want to be cured by them. Or, if you are more rogue and resistant to the President in your actions, the government will want to permanently silence the player, and the player must become a ghost, erasing their identity and hiding out as a drink slinger in a dive bar, only to have Reed or another agent wander in one day, letting the player know you can't escape the government, to which the player responds, V already escaped. I'm Johnny now. By having a unique ending for V that is derived from each unique path, the door would have been open for DLCs to take any direction and have any possible ending, since none of them would be canon. And if they decided to have one storyline in the next game and wanted to build off a storyline in this game, they could have done it using the Snake Plissken lesson from Escape from New York, the movie. In that movie, every person Snake comes across says, I thought Snake was dead. So in the next game, if they wanted a player to continue the story of V or refer to V as a character in the past, have someone say, didn't V become an agent? Or wasn't he assassinated by Arasaka? with different characters referring to all V's different endings as gossip or legend, with no one certain if V really died or which story is true. They could have had a lot of fun with that in NPC reactions and Easter eggs. However, this approach won't work as currently written, because in the main game story, there isn't an ending where V escapes alive and well, and V would need to at least survive as a hero fully attacked in one ending for V to become a legend, and rumors of whether he's alive or dead to continue into the next game. All CD Projekt Red had to do is let go of this idea that V had to have the same unceremonious ending in all storylines. They could have had not only given players the experience of choices they made leading to a unique outcome, it would have freed the game up to the possibility of V having a future in the franchise, even if it was just gossip of all the possible outcomes of V, and not actually in the game as a character. Game story theory isn't just about how to create a good game story in consistent history. It's also about using different storytelling techniques to create compelling, memorable, satisfying gameplay. Cyberpunk currently has time issues because it jumps from 2020, which is where the Pondsmith IP history lore ends, and 2077, the period which CD Projekt Red wanted to build their content from. But doing this created a weird 50-year technology stall in the Cyberpunk universe. In the original Cyberpunk universe, there was a World War II which Saburo Arasaka fought in as a soldier. This event happened in our reality as well, yet by 2020 in the Cyberpunk universe, their technology is much further advanced than where we are today. They had cybernetics, netrunners, and Alt Cunningham created the Soul Catcher technology with Arasaka in the 2020s. Yet, over 50 years later in 2077, Saburo Arasaka is still alive at 150. Rogue, one of Johnny Silverhand's rebel friends, is still alive and working as a fixer at 80 years old. Atom Smasher, still alive having lived the last 50 years basically as a brain in a robot. Netrunners still exist, advanced cybernetics are still the rage, and soul killer technology is still cutting edge and not fully deployed. It's as if the cyberpunk universe, which was advancing faster than ours, somehow stalled and didn't make any advances for 50 years. When Johnny gets stuck in our heads and we hear his voice, his friends and enemies are still our contacts and enemies, and none of the technology in this modern world surprises Johnny. He seems to know it all. Cigarettes are still the same, and even his favorite drink is still served at his favorite bar with his name. That would be like if I went into a bar today, lit up an unfiltered tobacco cigarette, and ordered a Roy Rogers. This is the first sign that shows what CD Projekt Red wanted for Cyberpunk's future, but was trying to have the game directly connect to the distant past. This world of 2077 and the technology advances could have existed in 2030, and it would have seemed believable. However, having the game leap from 2020 to 2077 created weird scenes that arise in the game from this time shift. One is the sex scene between Alt Cunningham and Johnny Silverhand. 
It doesn't happen at the beginning of the game and lead to a flash forward. It happens mid-game after you already know Johnny Silverhand and Alt Cunningham are dead. If alive, they would be in their 80s. A player is basically watching a sex movie of two dead people who could have been their grandparents. Now hopefully that didn't cross the minds of most players when seeing Alt Cunningham take off her pants. But to someone like me whose mind soaks up game story, I, I couldn't unsee it. I wanted to run across town and find a living cyber prostitute or escort for a brain dance just to replace the memory of grandparent porn. But then that arises the question of who actually exists in this new cyberpunk world. Rogue, Saburo Arasaka, Johnny, and Alt Cunningham are all 80 to 150 years old. Saburo Arasaka's children are about 80. Did Saburo Arasaka, a man who builds a family empire, have two children in his 70s, then go another 80 years without having another child? How many of Night City's citizens are senior citizens, and how many are the current generation of children in their teens to 30s? Is there a birth population problem? If people are active and working from 80 to 150, why isn't there an overpopulation problem or employment problems because old people aren't leaving their jobs? Why are Sabura Arasaka and a Japanese fixer Wakako Akata the only two people in the whole world who look really old? Did they say to their doctors, nah, don't make me look young, I want to keep the liver spots? Or do they lack cybernetics and cosmetic enhancements? And if so, does that mean if you don't get cybernetics, you can live to be over 150 years old. Thinking about all this made me stop looking for that Night City prostitute because she might look 20 some years old yet be the same prostitute my grandfather slept with when he was young. This takes us to the flip side of this technology stagnation and that is the biological sciences in this world are so advanced it makes the cybernetic world seem obsolete. We not only have this ability for people to live over 150 years old, where doubling human life expectancy in 50 years would be a miracle, but there exists this ability for Johnny's programming to rewrite V's DNA. Now forget about the engram or net runners. If software could actually alter a person's DNA without killing the body, that would be the greatest discovery ever, greater than personality engrams. If DNA can be rewritten, why couldn't it be reset to someone so they didn't age or de-aged or why not remove physical or birth defects? If software could rewrite DNA, they could engineer the DNA to make the person taller, stronger, smarter, and not do it with surgery or cybernetics, but with Arasaka code. How is that not the greatest invention? If you lived in this world, would you rather pay money to have an engram made that killed your soul with the hope a body would someday come available for you to inhabit? Or would you rather have your DNA changed to make you taller, faster, smarter, and more attractive right now? If the code they put into Johnny is able to restart a dead body like it did to V, and was designed to restart life in a brain-dead person, as Hellman states, doesn't that remove the need for a personality engram? Why not just have code that can restart the body and preserve the brain, instead of rewriting the brain with a soulless engram? It's as if the biological sciences in the game used to make engrams have the ability to move back into a human body causes the need for a personality engram to be obsolete. The game creators also ignore what DNA is. If V's DNA is being rewritten to be Johnny's DNA, why is V's appearance not changing to look like Johnny? DNA is our eye color hair color, skin tone, height, sex. If V is female, she should be getting facial hair, not lowering her voice or changing genitalia. It's as if those making the game have no idea what DNA is and does, but decided it would be a good plot device. This takes us back to the issue of grand ideas by creative people that fail on implementation. The ability of a program to rewrite DNA might sound good in a writer's room to explain and justify story. But when that idea becomes part of a game world that has a past, present, and future outside the game, it breaks the world, it makes biological sciences seem more advanced than the digital sciences the world is built on. That idea transforms the world from cyberpunk to biopunk. This is where the video takes a turn that those of you still watching probably didn't expect. I am an advocate 
for game story theory. I'm not an advocate for game canon, game history, or game tradition. Even though I believe within a game franchise, it's important to establish and create canon, a game history, and tradition. Now, how can I be a believer without being an advocate of history and canon? Because I'm a realist. I understand that creating games is an economic for-profit venture. It's about a company getting the rights and ownership of the franchise they create, and not about paying someone else for the rights to that franchise. Right now, CD Projekt Red is paying Pondsmith, the creator of the cyberpunk role-playing tabletop game, to base this game in his world, his story, his character creations. And let's assume Pondsmith learned from what happened to the Witcher rights owner, who sold the rights to CD Projekt Red for a flat fee, only to see no royalties come in when the games went mega popular. Now, I haven't been able to verify this, but let's assume Pondsmith will be getting royalties on Cyberpunk 2077's success. CD Projekt Red also learned lessons from the Witcher franchise. CD Projekt Red had a lot to do with expanding the Witcher property in the visual entertainment media. When Netflix made the Witcher series, it was the TV rights they had to purchase from the original rights owner, not from CD Projekt Red. CD Projekt Red didn't get any royalties from the TV show, even though they had a lot to do with making The Witcher popular to a broad audience. With Cyberpunk, they did purchase the TV and film rights, but they did probably have to concede to pay royalties to Pondsmith on success, shown by the fact that Pondsmith was brought on as a consultant. If they got the Cyberpunk rights for a flat fee, I don't think Pondsmith would have been a consultant. But since Pondsmith had an invested interest in the financial success of the Cyberpunk game, and if CD Projekt Red was going to be paying out future royalties to Pondsmith, they might as well bring him in, if only to hype the game among fans by saying he's part of the project. Having Pondsmith on as a consultant means he's also an employee of CD Projekt Red and likely signed a non-disclosure agreement, meaning he won't be leaking any news of the game, nor will he be allowed to criticize the game after launch, even if he didn't like how they handled the story and lore. So how does all this talk about rights and royalties affect the storyline of Cyberpunk? Well, let's take a look at Amazon's Ring of Power and quickly discuss how originality can move the ownership of property rights. When Amazon paid for the rights for the Cimmerillion, some people think they overpaid because Cimmerillion had an incomplete lore and story. But I believe Amazon realized the lack of things in the Cimmerillion made it so valuable. If Amazon wanted to stick to Tolkien lore, they would have done that. However, if Amazon stuck to Lord of the Rings lore, their financial recoup would only come from show profits, and being a streaming show on their own platform is minimal profit. Sticking to lore also would have helped market all Lord of the Rings products and movies, making money for the properties they did not own. Amazon realized it could create original Tolkien product. The Harfoots are an Amazon original. Hobbits were sedentary in shires and liked to keep to themselves. Harfoots were nomadic and therefore explorers by nature. They made Harfoots significantly different to claim them as original from Hobbits. Now, Harfoots suck, but if they became popular, anyone using Harfoots and Future Tolkien would have had to pay Amazon to do that. I know Amazon didn't have the rights to Hobbits with the Cimmerillion, but I believe if they did, Amazon Hobbits would have had the same traits as the Harfoots, making them different enough to be claimed as an original. Even if someone else owned Tolkien story rights, they would have to pay Amazon to use Amazon's original Tolkien world creations. Critics point out that these companies are losing money not cashing in on loyal fans by creating content that stick to an IP history and lore. But to understand, we have to look at this issue through the eyes of a corporation. They could shoot for the short-term profits of a game show or movie that is limited to that production, minus the royalties they pay, but being loyal to the IP lore. That IP loyalty means their product's popularity increases the value of the base IP making more money for the IP owners and any products that the IP has that the company doesn't own, like previous books and movies. It also means their products could be redone in the future. As loved as the Jackson trilogies are, a studio could buy the rights to the books in the future and replace those movies with a new trilogy, making Jackson's trilogy obsolete. 
Compare that to the long-term profits of creating original Tolkien material. Amazon owns the rights to that is based on an IP. If anyone in the future wanted to make a product from the base IP using these new original creations, they would have to pay companies like Amazon or CD Projekt Red royalties for the rights to use these new original creations. The popularity and marketing of these new original content only applies to these new products because it's different from the base IP content. And if their original content becomes more popular than the base IP, their new original variation of the product becomes more valuable than the base IP because companies want to build off this new content. All this brings us to Netflix and CD Projekt Red's Edge Runner animated series. Why do you think the time placement for this show is a prequel to the game? We have talked about how CD Projekt Red is trying to create original content that is different than the base IP Cyberpunk. How do they create an isolated time period that allows them to detach from the 2020 lore and build on a more recent and original history? They place their Cyberpunk game far into the future, 2077, and create prequel history that takes place right before 2077. That prequel history is Edge Runner. Netflix Edge Runner Animation, which is based on CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077 world, is being used to create a more recent history, one that isn't built from 2020, but building toward 2077. If successful, it will mean that future Cyberpunk game stories could be building from Edge Runner, using characters and storylines that aren't directly connected to 2020, and fix the generation issues that exist from the time leap of 2020 to 2077. It will further isolate 2077 into its own original entity, making CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk less dependent on the main IP lore, becoming a standalone cyber world where they can create their own history and lore. Now this is where I remind viewers that although Cyberpunk is a Pondsmith IP, Cyberpunk existed since William Gibson's Neuromancer. Cyberpunk is a genre. And CD Projekt Red does not need rights to create in a genre. They only need rights to build from the Pondsmith story lore and use the brand name. The Edge Runner animation title is the first break from that cyberpunk brand name. Down the road, if CD Projekt Red continued to build their own cyberpunk world from their own cyberpunk properties, it's conceivable CD Projekt Red could create a cyber world that is not tied to the original cyberpunk IP and not have to pay Pondsmith for those particular projects because they're not based in nor include content from his IP, nor use the cyberpunk title name. If their cyberpunk IP runs as long as their Witcher franchise and spawns more television and movie content, we might be looking at an Edge Runner universe where the cyberpunk IP is only tied to the earliest projects created by CD Projekt Red and not later projects. To understand the cost benefit of creating original content, let's look at the financials of 2077. It cost about 400 million to make and market cyberpunk 2077 and over 100 million to add in Phantom Liberty. It's estimated about 50 million was lost due to a bad launch. That puts us over $550 million in expenses. They sold over $750 million on the game and DLC, putting gross profits at about $200 million. Now, $200 million seems like a lot of money, but from that you have to subtract royalties, subtract taxes, subtract the cost of having an ongoing maintenance staff fixing bugs and updates, as well as an ongoing administrative staff. The expenses to a company don't end at game launch. Let's be generous and say Cyberpunk 2077 has a net gross of $150 million. A company does not spend $550 million and years of employee work and dedication to make $150 million. CD Projekt Red learned from the mistakes with the Witcher IP and made sure to get the movie, TV, and animation rights for the Cyberpunk world when they were getting rights to the game. So... CD Projekt Red is making money on the animated Edge Runner series. The series also acts as marketing and continues interest in the Cyberpunk 2077 game. Now consider everything I said in a video about companies who create original content for the ownership and rights to that original content. Consider the focus on building up the abilities of Netrunners and the concept of characters being immortal and being able to come back to life 
while not making Johnny Silverhand a hero and killing off the player's character V, preserving ideas that are unique and distinctive to CD Projekt Red's version and not part of the core IP. Pondsmith may own the base cyberpunk story rights. He does not own the rights to the 2077 timeline. Now this is where the idea of rights and story can become intermeshed with corporate decisions. Remember when I said cyberpunk is a genre and not a property? What if CD Projekt Red made a game called Edge Runner 2097 and didn't use the cyberpunk name, nor any of the names or history in the Pondsmith storylines, and instead based it on the original characters and content they created for Cyberpunk 2077 and Edge Runner that were solely CD Projekt Red's creations. This product could conceivably be the sole ownership and rights of CD Projekt Red, and CD Projekt Red not have to pay rights or royalties for this. Now, this doesn't mean they would stop paying for the rights of C Cyberpunk the Pondsmith. They probably want to keep those rights as long as possible to prevent competition from making any cyberpunk games or media based in the history and using the title cyberpunk. But if CD Projekt Red did succeed, they would have a new franchise that other companies and mediums would have to pay them the right to use. At this point, all of you should understand why I have concerns over the future of this franchise with CD Projekt Red. They have every motivation, both financial and legal, to create original content separate from the base IP. We as fans don't have the right to expect companies who spend hundreds of millions to create projects to be loyal to the base IP stories and lore if that's not what the company wants to do. We have a right not to purchase these products and we have a right to demand good storytelling from what they produce. And we as consumers and audiences have been doing that. Marvel, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, and Amazon's Rings of Power have all suffered from audiences closing their eyes and their wallets to the substandard products these companies have been pushing out on their new variations of classic IPs. CD Projekt Red needs to learn from these companies' mistakes and from the issues of Cyberpunk 2077. I wish CD Projekt Red luck, and I urge them to implement less new ideas and take more time applying game story theory to the ideas they do include in the cyberpunk games and more time to fully develop these ideas. If they create a better balance between their new ideas and classic video game storytelling techniques, they will create a more stable game history and lore while ensuring a bright future to the 2077 game franchise, whether it's based on the classic lore or one of their own creations.